Good morning, Chris. How are you? Hey, man. I'm good to see. I'm good. How are you? Good to see you. I'm good. I'm awake. I took. Uh, this is Brian Jones. Uh, I'm here with Chris Hood, professional options trader, world's most interesting man. Look at that hair. Man, that. I tell you, looking good looking good. It's it's the new weapon, Brian. It's the new weapon. The, the, each of the gray hairs, I can either say it's a trade that's gone gone wrong, or it's the soul of a victim in jujitsu that's been crushed. I, I haven't worked it out yet. Well, it looks good on you, man. The salt and pepper thing is is a uh, it's a. Uh, I hear it's good. I I like. I actually, I'm just just salt at this point. But <laughs> my but, wife says I look homeless. <laughs> you know, you you look distinguished. I'm I'm trying to get that old age pensioners discount down at the chemist at the pharmacy. You know, when you walk in there and they say, "Can I see your ID?" and it's like, "Well, I didn't know you had to be over 21 to buy this." They go, "No, we just want to see if you get the over 65 pensioners discount." Yeah, yeah. So, hey, you got to take it. We can get it. Man, in Canada, jeepers! Yeah, you have to with with gas prices the way they are now. <laughs> you take a freebie whenever you get it. So, so the gas prices here, I'm not sure how it translates. So you guys go by liters. And we're going by gallons. But do you know what the gallon to liter ratio is? No, I can get Siri to do it. It's, it's, uh, it's expensive. That's all I know. Yeah. Well, let's let's put it this way. Two years ago, prior to COVID, our gas price was under a dollar. And now we're paying two twenty. So, you know, this is where the cost of living really starts to affect people. And we're starting to see now in the housing market, things are starting to cool off a little bit. Canadian Central Bank is starting to add, uh, you know, rate increases along the way. You know, life up here has become more expensive. Yeah, same here. Same here. I think uh, the gro average grocery trip is probably 40, 50% more expensive yeah. than, than as last year. What's meat, that? The meat, meat prices are really high now. Yeah, beef is, is ridiculous. So steak and everything like that. And I know they have I would have thought that the global warming cabal would have you know, made beef cheaper so that we can start eating more cows so that we can stop the global warming. But clearly that's not happening. Now, what's that? I've triggered a whole lot of people now. So <laughs> we're going to well, have to just in a short time, we're going to have to start farming grubs, you know, for enough protein. To survive. <laughs> oh my God. I, I, I sometimes find the political agendas are just hard to work out. So I just don't even pay attention anymore. It's not, not even worth, uh, not even worth looking at. So yeah. So what what are we looking at with I know the market's been sort of bouncing around sort of range bound for a bit. Yeah, it's it's sort of range bound. We've got a couple of um, uh, things going on. Let's uh, let's share the screen here and, and we'll see. So let's look at SPY. I'm gonna I'm gonna put it here on the 375 minute chart. We're gonna take off the EMA indicators. We're gonna look mainly at the squeezes today. So you know we had this sort of breakout move here above this volatility band, that long signal over here that was triggered around about 26th of May, nice little run up. And then we hit this resistance. I'm just gonna put some, I'm gonna put some layers on here so we can actually see where we are. Um, and, just, and just in case, you know, somebody's kind of joining us and they don't really understand the volatility band. Uh, the volatility <laughs> band is sort of, you know, giving a, a range of prices that is normal for it to be in, you know, yeah, a sort of tolerance level, should we say, to where price can be at any given time on that chart. So it's more like you, you can widen these things, you can narrow them depending on your own tolerance as a trader, right? There's no right or wrong. And, and a lot of people try and look for this holy grail, you know, obviously, if trader A uses this setting, then obviously, it must work, right? But you've got to look at what your own individual habits and form, you know, uh, trading action is and how you interpret these things so for me my tolerance level is sort of around a 1.3 1.4 times the normal range of movement on price i'm fine with that in markets that become a lot more range bound or trending then i can adjust them either way right so it's not there's no standard that says this is better than that it's it's more about what you're willing to tolerate so for me we had that breakout move it moved up and then hit this resistance here we have the supply zone we know that there are people that are going to be selling. We know that there are buyers in this market as well. If we look down at volume, we didn't have any sort of big market days where we had huge amounts of volume. That was the last big one that we had here, this mm -hmm. movement to the downside. Now we're just going to chop, right? So if we take that off, if we take that off, we add that. 
we can see these very thin red lines that are forming, these thin layers. This is our resistance layers. These are the ones where we're going to see some, you know, some degree of chop. Now, in this sort of price action, if you look at price doing this, we're just bouncing up and down, right? Are we bouncing near the bottom? Are we going to be hitting some key levels and falling back? No one knows. Anyone who goes out there and says, this is what's going to happen. I, I think you, you're finding hills that you're willing to die on is not my thing, right? So what I try and do is look at if price is compressing, right? So this is when we know price is compressing. We can see here on our momentum, things are starting to slow down to the upside. But on the shorter lengths, we can see potentially the slingshot starting to form. So if we can compress around here, if the bulls can keep us up a little bit, if the bears don't win out and we can have price sitting here for a few days, we may get squeezes starting to form here on these lower lengths, which is then going to translate into the higher length and then push the price back up to the upside. So I think this is just my view. You have to understand range, right? So for me, when I go and look at the SPY, I go, well, I have to understand the micro time frames. I trade predominantly off a 15 minute chart during the day, and I use the twos and the fives to validate. I don't take the signals off here, but I just use the candle action to validate. So here you can see yesterday, we had a nice short trade from, um, from around one o'clock. We got out at around 3.30. We don't have any trade on at the moment here for SPY. We've got some long duration puts. I still think the downside is the more magnetic. I think that the market will come down and retest lows. So we do have some long puts in play for the summer. Um, but we don't have any active open trade that we carried forward to tonight or to this morning because there's just nothing here. We've got a red volatility band here. We've got this layer of resistance. We've crossed over our range line and we are sitting inside the eight, the five, the eight and the 13 EMA. So this would have given us an indication of just wait. We need to wait for confirmation of direction before you would place a trade. So here, obviously, market falling to the downside this morning on the pre-market. What generally happens is when we have gaps down, the market tends to rally to the upside. When we have these gaps up, we tend to rally to the downside. There you can see yesterday's movement. A lot of guys got caught buying in long, going in too quickly here without seeing this red zone. All right. Without seeing that red zone, you would have bought long calls, long calls, long calls, and you got killed. So in, in just a question about <laughs> time frames. So you're you're saying you know you're still holding some long puts or you know you have a, a sort of a bearish view on the market uh, on the in the long term like what time what time frame are we talking about for holding the long puts so on the long puts we would look at it here on the weeklies and the monthly so let me open up the weekly and the monthly so here you've got the weekly and the monthly charts together with the daily right and if you look here Kev. So what sort of like expirations are we looking at on those? So on these, I've got Augusts, right? So I'm using August and I'm using target levels down here at around 380. We're still inside the realm of the expected move. And obviously what you can do is as we start to fail here at the, tw at the I think this is the eight. Let me just double check it. Um, if we go in here, let me just double check these lines again. Uh, here we have the eight, right? So this is the eight. Here's the 21, right? So we're failing at the eight. Here you can see market coming down. We rallied back to the eight. Now we come back down. We've got some momentum to the upside. Volatility is dropping. Um, we've got some sort of downside momentum starting to lose some power here. We might not fall all the way back here. We might just bounce and then go back up again. So when I trade the weekly chart, which is clearly bearish, right? This is a bearish chart. We're in a red volatility band. We're trending to the downside. The, the path of least resistance is this way, then August, September are the dates that I'm looking to trade into, right? And when it comes to levels, it all depends on price affordability. Um, it also depends on your tolerance for volatility, right? So if we're going to be bouncing like this, those 380, 390 puts that I bought, they tend to go, you know, profitable, not so profitable. <laughs> they tend to give it back really quickly. So I'm looking to hold these trades for a few more weeks before I close them. I, I'm not looking to trade them short duration, right? I'm planning to hold them for a while. When we look at the day chart, we have a slightly different scenario, right? Green vol band trending up. We've got this resistance uh, support zone up here. 
we've got to break through these. I, I try and teach my clients, what we try and do is trade into white space, right? The greater the white space, the better the trade, right? And you can see here on the daily chart, if you're trading off the day chart, you've got a lot of green and a lot of white. You don't have a lot of red here. You've got this zone up here. You've got this zone down here. We could come all the way down here. And this would be completely normal. Completely normal. It's within the realm of acceptance, right? Because this green line there is inside the range of volatility that I've set for myself. So we can tolerate SPY going all the way up to 430. And we can tolerate it coming all the way down to 395. That's the accepted range of volatility that we are prepared to accept. So when you look at the monthly, this is where it starts becoming really uncomfortable. All right. Red volatility band. The squeeze has not even started firing to the short side. What makes me think that this is going to go red is the stochastic, which is this line that we have here. The line has gone from green to orange to red. This will shoot to the downside. As long as this red stays there, this is coming down here, which means price is going to do that. Could we hit 380 on the month chart? Absolutely within the realm of acceptance because our volatility acceptance is down to at least 340. So the 380 puts put the price of SPY right there. And those puts on that journey are going to become very, very valuable if this journey happens before August. Right. So that's the sort of thesis that I play for myself is that I have I trade this chart for some long duration holds. I'm not looking to trade them on a day to day basis on days where we have these sort of bounces. I will add to my puts. I buy more because those puts become cheaper. I can average down while I'm playing this trend on the side here. Now, averaging down is not my favorite thing. I prefer to average up when trades tend to work in the right direction. So what we're looking for here is a break of the eight. We're looking for this to fall back down come down towards 395. This is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for that 395, that, that sort of fall to 395. So when it comes to playing your trends and your charts, a lot of people get confused. They sort of mix up their analysis. They take a trade off the weekly chart and then they go to the daily and they start managing it over here, which is two different charts. This one is quite bullish. This one is still bearish. You can't take a trade off a bearish chart and then manage it on a bullish chart. It doesn't it creates confusion. You get a lot of indicator and signal confusion. You know, when you start favoring, not favoring, if you have too many things on your chart and you're taking too many signals that may differ, you might be like, oh, well, the squeeze said this, but the EMA said that. And then, you know, the Bollinger's do this and the VIX does that and the volume does that. But they're on two different charts. They're on the if you're on two different charts or three different charts, it just creates this mass confusion. So try as a trader to just stick to one, right? So for me personally, if I'm day trading, it's the 15, okay? The whole, guys, the whole time on a day trade with the 15 is, what do you think? I close it by 345. I'm done. So it's with definitely always intraday on that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't hold them overnight. If it's a 15-minute chart, I won't hold overnight. I will close it by 345 and I'm done. Uh, generally, I will just... You know, I, I, I don't set my profit targets too aggressively. So usually when you're trading a 15 minute chart, I've got my profit targets sitting at these levels, right? So over between today and tomorrow, the market is already telling us in the expected move on the options chain that SPY is either going to be at 406 or it's going to be at 417. That the market is already telling us it's going to be one of those directions. We, we you know, it could, chop around here, but the market makers are pricing in a move there or a move here. That's, that's what they're telling us. So you can trade. I, I usually do this. I, I will put the top line in, the bottom line in, and you can use this tool in um, trading view, which is the ghost feed, right? So from here, if I just go to tomorrow, if I just zone out a little bit here, this is towards tomorrow. So tomorrow's the eighth. From there, I'm just going to go right you know, if I just draw that and I go by 12.30 tomorrow, I'm expecting the price to be somewhere there and or it's not going to be and it's going to be or it's going to be down there. What you would do is you would just wait for the pattern to start to form. So when SPY opens up in each 15 minutes, we're going to get a new candle. You'll either see it going towards this side or you'll see it going towards that side. So you're just setting your 
uh, the two ghost feeds up with the where price is, and then it's the plus. It calculates where it, move. how it will get there. Yeah. Plus the expected move, and then minus the expected move for the yeah. Change. Okay. But now it's quite easy to work out whether something is going against going in your thesis or against your thesis, right? So would you buy calls if the market starts to go this way? Are you buying calls? No. You always buy in the direction of the trade, right? So if this is going down here, you're buying puts. Now, obviously, you're going to have to be careful around these green zones and you're going to have to be careful around the red zones because we could go this way, fail, and then come back down here. We could go there, bounce, and go that way. Totally possible. All of those scenarios are possible. But you're not going to get that movement without your oscillators at the bottom being in line with that direction. So we cannot expect a movement to this downside if this is all positive. If this is all bullish, the move might fake you this way and then go that way. So this is why your indicators are quite important because your oscillators are set up the way that I've set these up. It gives me an indication of what's possible, you know, what, what's possibly going to happen, right? It's not, you know, the thing is a lot of people laugh whenever I say it's, there's a high degree of predictability with these things because the way in which they work is that the squeezes tend to be fairly accurate, right? So if you go here and you look at that squeeze that triggered to the upside, price moved to the upside, there's your second green, you close, you go to the short side. It, it's a fairly consistent cycle, right? Buy long, take your profits, go the other way, take your profits, and, and so on. When you adjust the length of the squeeze, right? So not we're not adjusting the time frame of the chart. I'm keeping it on the chart. What I'm doing is I'm just shortening the calculation of how I determine if there's a squeeze. So, so I'm not doing anything else. Number of bars that you use in the calculation. Well, this one would be three, five, 10, 20, right? right? So you would use three, five, 10, 20. This is the length, right? So we, we're adjusting the length of the squeeze. Now, obviously, if a three squeeze is starting to go blue, then the five squeeze is going to go blue pretty quickly after that. And so will the 10 and so will the 20. And similarly, when the, blue, when the three squeeze starts to lose momentum, the five squeeze starts to lose momentum shortly after, then the, tw the, the 10, and then the 20. So you can almost predict when you've got big movements in volume, shifts in the squeeze, and a change in the direction of the stochastic indicator, that movements will be big. Go, if we have a look here at this cluster of yellows, yellow candles down here at the bottom, okay? Have a look at that short duration squeeze, that three squeeze. Do you notice how the stochastic turned green and we started to get a low blue bar. You see that little indicator that, that, that set up over here on volume, right? You see volume over here. If we go here, we just, you know, if you look at that candle, right? This candle printed at 345 on, when was that? Monday afternoon, no, Friday, right? This was Friday, 3rd of June. If you had that, candle pattern on that candle with this setup, an aggressive trader could have bought calls at 345 on Friday for the Monday open based on that. Okay, if that's in your plan, you could have done that. You don't like to do the overnight I, with the 15. I will start, sometimes I will do it. Here I set a butterfly, right? So on this, I did a butterfly for the end of day, you know, made some money on SPX, but yeah, I will tend to do that times, but it, it's cheap, right? You're going to put a hundred bucks in. It's like a lottery trade, right? You're going to buy a hundred dollar option. You're going to move it over, hold it for the weekend. And if it pops on Monday, you might get 200, maybe $300 out. Something like that. The, the challenge that you've got by holding over a weekend is expirations together with theta decay, right? So theta decay will kill that trade over those two days. And if you get it wrong on Monday, you're done, right? So you can't go and, you know, bend the farm. This, this is not it. It's yeah. hard to adjust those trades when they're. Yeah, because you're literally doing a, a single bet kind of trade. But mm -hmm. you can notice something. If you bought a call option there on Friday, 345, when you saw this, because this is a leading indicator to a shift here, to a shift here, and a shift here, that's what you would have got on Monday. 
So when you trade, it a lot depends on how you interpret and how you set up your, your signals, right? I use multiple triggers. I don't just use the squeeze. This is just one. I use EMA crosses. I use the squeeze. I use volatility. I use breakouts. I use trend lines. I use a lot of things. And when those things all converge and they're doing the same thing at the same time, and when they're all sort of saying, go long, that's when you have high probability trades. This would have been, in any case, this would have been a low probability trade. Why? Because this has already gone blue. That one had gone blue. This one had gone blue. This one is just about to go above zero. This could have easily just been a one bar squeeze and fallen to the downside, just as easily, just as much as it went up, it could have gone down. So when you start trading and you set up your indicators, many people you know, will ignore the benefit of looking at various lengths. They don't do it. Most retail traders won't do it. They will be very binary. All right. So most people will look only at, let's take a, a 5, 8, 13 cross. Okay, so this is a 518, 513 or 5813 cross on the EMAs. You went long here. What do we do when we trade? We don't chase gaps up, right? So a 5813 crossover on an EMA would have given almost a false signal. Because if you took this here on that gap up, you would have lost because your exit signal was down here. So there's buy, sell. You've lost money. So it's not the most practical way to trade when you're looking at um, gaps up, right? So sometimes EMAs or moving averages don't take that into account. So it's up to the skill of the trader to look at the scenario that's on the, on the screen and say, no, that's not the setup that I take. I don't trade gaps up. Uh, you know, you can't take these blind. That's what I'm trying to say. And it's the same thing with these things down here. So what I look for is when that's saying long and this is all aligned right? All aligned. Okay. There's an opportunity. Now we wouldn't take that signal, even though this is aligned because we've got this big zone of resistance that sits on top of us. So you don't take a long signal just because it says long, you have to see where price can fail. So this long signal would only be valid once we break above that level. You can't take that signal until you get there because there's this red box, right? Red boxes push price down. What did it do? hit the red box and it fell down. So a trader can't just go, oh, but my signal said yes, so I'm gonna take a trade. No, you have to always look at what are the reasons not to do the trade? Well, there's this resistance line. Wouldn't it be safer to wait for it to get there, get a confirmation, so two closes above that level, right? Two closes above that level, it's a 15 minute chart, so this would take you 45 minutes. Two closes above that level because that's where resistance is now turned into support. Then you do the trade. It, so this is where patience is important, right? So here you would have gone in, you would have lost money if you just took the signal blind because of that fail. In fact, if you did this properly, you would have got in there and got out there because this would have broken your, your trend line, right? So that's this is where you take your, your exit or your profits. It's like a trailing stop. So right now on the 15 minute chart, there's no trade um until we get a clear direction right i can't trade that because it's an orange stochastic i have some blue starting to form here lots of selling yesterday afternoon so when we have lots of selling and price moves in the direction of volume so we've got lots of selling this hasn't gone down all right we have to understand that the trends might not continue so we have to be careful this might just be a, a gap down in the morning and then a bounce in the afternoon so we've got to be very careful. You can't just play the buy. You, you can't just play what you see here. You've got to think to yourself, where would the trade be? If we open down here, I can't really do anything to the short side until we get underneath this green, this green level here at 406. Then we can basically short it. But remember, the market is saying by tomorrow, it's pricing in a move to there. So now we're already here. So this side is still possible. This is still possible if the market goes down and then it comes up, but it's not going to do this unless these are all bullish. And right now they're all bearish. Slingshot, 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 slingshot. So there's a lot of work to be done here. So what you do is you go, well, how do I know if that's going to change on the 15 minute? If the 15 minute is your key chart where you take your signals from, where do you get an indication of what's going to happen on the 15 is you have to come into the lower time frames. Here's the five. You can see on the five, 
Our stochastic is coming up off the oversold level. We've lost some upward momentum. It's hooking. You see how it's turning there. We've got two bars, one, you know, no bars. We've got two, two. This needs to go green. If this goes green, if I just turn on that signal, I'm just waiting for this to go, go long. Once it says long here, if it says long here, I have synergy. I have conformity of signal. I can trade that to the upside because I've got support from the lower time frame. Here on the two minute chart, which is a lot faster, you had a lot of buying in the final two minutes yesterday. And you've got a lowering of momentum on the squeezes across the 20, the 10, the five and the three. So this is probably going to come down. This may sort of hover and then we could see this bounce here. That's what I see. So how you trade it and what you trade, it's always down to how you do the setup. Because the problem that most people have is there's this emotional demon that sits on your shoulder. And, you know, you've got Jim Cramer, you know, I, I watched Jim Cramer say, oh, you know, the, the, the bear market is over. Summer is going to be great. And, and you do know that there's this common myth that says, whatever he says, you go the opposite. So if he yeah, says summer is predictions, <laughs> yeah. So he's saying summer will be great. Uh, I'm sticking with my puts. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, so there's been a little bit. I know um, we're going to wrap up here in a second, but as far as the energy sector, yeah, uh, that seems to be doing well right now and and uh, moving up. What are you? What are your thoughts on energy? Yeah, I think that that's probably where the opportunity lies. We we did a trade yesterday on XLE, so we we got back into XLE yesterday. Um, so let's, let me just open up the chart here. So if we open up XLE and let's put it onto the 375 and reset this. Okay, so XLE, you can see bottom left, top right. This is trending very, very strongly. So if I put on my, my volatility baseline, it's gonna come now, just calculating. There. So let me just change this a little bit. So if I put this onto the day, onto the 375, green volatility band, there was our long trigger here. We had a profit taking over there, but we got back in. All right. So why do we get back in? Because we're trending strongly above the 8 and the 13 EMA. We're in a green volatility band. I've got positive momentum, albeit weakening, on the 20. Um, I think that the long story around energy is so much more compelling than anything else. I, I think that this is the one area where you can't avoid the consumption in this space, right? So we know that people are gonna to continue to buy gas regardless of what happens to price. It, 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 you know, it's got a very uh, sort of inelastic demand curve, right? People are still gonna be driving cars whether the gas is two bucks or five bucks, 10 bucks, it doesn't matter. So the XLE space looks good. The, the pick of the, of the sector at the moment is definitely Exxon, right? So with Exxon, we have a trade that we put on, that we're going to put on with a break above this level, right? So at 100.97, if we can get there, then there's a long trade for us in play, right? So let me, if I can just find my actual chart. I, I was doing it, I've got so many charts here and it just annoys me sometimes when I forget which one I was using. Uh, I think you, it was you have a lot of charts, Chris. I do, I do. And I play around with a lot of them, right? I don't, right. Um, yeah, we go there. So this was the trade that we were talking about yesterday uh, on a confirmed break above 100.97. We'd be looking to use 98.08 as the stop. Um, here is the, the one trade that happened. That was a long trade that was good. Um, but this effectively would be the next trade, right? But we don't want to do it until we get above these levels, right? So uh, Exxon, definitely a, a nice looking opportunity. Uh, the other one that came out, and I know it's not in the energy space, was obviously Amazon with its split. Um, we, we've got a 300% odd trade that we've done on Amazon. We did it off that long signal from a week, a, a week and a bit ago. Uh, what we found, well, the trade that we did here was a put credit spread together with a call butterfly um and this one this one will probably work out over time 
Um, Amazon looks good. Uh, other trades that we have on the go. Let, let's have a look at these ETFs because the, you have to look at XES as well uh, within the energy space. This is a very illiquid option. So, you know, you can't really, uh, you know, the thing about liquidity is it's great when you're right, but it's an absolute nightmare to deal with when you're wrong. You know, you're not going to get out when, you know, very oh, easily. Get your order filled, yeah. So this one here, a break above, you know, 8043 would probably put us into a zone up here. That would be a, a reasonable trade if you switch this to the 130 minute chart. So this is the low, kind of, yeah. just, a, just a question on the low liquidity. It seems to be better, or at least in my experience, to, to just buy calls as opposed to trying to buy a spread. Because Sometimes actually on the low liquidity, just buy the shares. Yeah. Yeah. It, but if you had to buy an option, the spreads are a nightmare to actually close. It seems yeah. like, you spreads have to become go. problematic. Single leg trades tend to tend to be okay as long as you go into a, a, a strike that's got sufficient liquidity to get you out. So, you know, 20 to 30 open interest contracts will probably get you in and out. That's fine. But if it's zero or less than 30, yeah, be careful because if you're wrong and you want to try and use your stop loss, it's going to be you know problematic. Here you can see how these setups work, right? So here we have this breakout above the top of that volatility band. It's green. We're above the range line. We've got momentum on our side. You can see the stochastic pointing up. Here the squeeze is fired on the 15. This is using the 15, the 10, and the 5. The 10 and the, the 15 tend to be a little bit more influential on the 20 than the 5. So you can enter on the five, but you can start scaling. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't normally, you know, do a full allocation trade on that. I would probably go with one third, one third, one third. So by the time this fires to the upside on the bright green, I've already got my full position in allocation. So yeah, you can see when we get the next long signal, reasonable win rate. I mean, a lot of people put too much emphasis on this. I don't. I think that humans can sometimes outperform computers. Um, you know, the computer, when you're trading as a robot, it's very good because there's this unemotional piece, right? But remember, whenever you build a, a, a set of tools, the conditions are finite, right? You have to have all these conditions in play before you can have a trade. So you might find a human can outperform a robot on the very, very short term, but over the long run, the computer will win, the robot will win. So here I can see, okay, the signal is reasonably powerful or reasonably successful, and it's reasonably powerful, right? So when we've got profit factors above one, it means that the amplitude of the move, the average amplitude of the move is sufficient for me to be able to say, you know what, I'm gonna get some money out of this trade. And I know that the average duration is gonna be around eight bars. So here, if I go long there and I'm basing it off the 10 and the 15, I probably want to do just one contract here, probably do another contract just above this red zone and another contract just above that red zone. And I'm going to trade it up that way. Okay, trail your stop using this trend line, um, you know, and then just drag the stop up as the trade gets better. But this again, it's not the most liquid option chain. So you might be better off just using XLE, which is far more um, liquid. And it has a very similar chart pattern, right? So you can probably get the same uh, out of this one. You could also look at the ERX, which is the leverage version. This one has similar chart structure as well. So once you start seeing the similarities, okay, you can, you can trade this one as a call spread. You could add XLE. Just be careful about not overloading all in the energy sector. You don't want to be too exposed to that. Um, there are other sectors worth looking at, although you've just got to wait for right, the right setups, right? So don't chase anything. At this market, if you chase an open gap, you're going to get hammered. If you chase a gap down, you're going to get hammered. So just let things play itself out. The best traders are the ones that don't trade all the time. You know, they, they, they trade when it, when it fits. You know, it's like, right, right. don't chase anything. There, there should never be a compulsion. You should never feel like you have to do anything. You know, there's more than enough opportunity lying there for you to be picking up pennies. But if you go pick up pennies in front of a steamroller, not healthy. You know, yeah. you're taking an unnecessary risk, right? So in this kind of market, 
you know, just play it safe. You know, at the end of the day, you want to be able to come back tomorrow, right? So play it safe, play small. Don't over, you know, don't overcommit to anything. Don't let your, your bias rule, you know, over, you know, take over. You know, rather check your biases at the door. You know, if you've got a, you know, a trade set up, you know, I'm going to trade long when it goes that way and I'm going to trade short when it goes this way. I, I can't trade any other way. I can't say I'm going to go short from there because if it carries on, I'm in trouble. You know, so you always have to, you know, take opinions like my of my of like mine with a pinch of salt, really. You know, I trade what I see. I don't trade what I hear from other people or whatever. So similarly, don't trade what I say. Rather, make your own judgment, look at the charts and practice your own setup. And then you've got something that's sustainable. Otherwise, you're always going to be reliant on other people to determine whether you should trade or not. And that's the worst part to be in as a trader. Don't be reliant on anyone. Rather, build your own tool, you know, build your own setup, trade your own setup. I avoid the noise. There's just so much information out there that's garbage. And most people don't realize it's garbage until it's too late. So, you know, hopefully this stuff helps people. If it does, great. Let me know. If it doesn't, you know, find what works for you. You know, there's no, you know, I, I don't want to say that I've got the holy grail, but I, I just, you know, I've done this long enough to realize that. You're doing pretty right? good. You're doing pretty good at it. I think people should listen. Uh, at least, uh, you know, it's, it's um, I agree. People should learn how to filter their own trades, but uh, yeah. you definitely got some some advice to give them. <laughs> you know, when I first started trading, it, it was the information out there was not as easily available. And the, the problem that came out with uh, option information was it, was it was all dated, right? So you were reading books that were written 10 years earlier that looked great, right? And it was very difficult you know, 20 years ago, <clears throat> to be able to take a book that was 10 years old already and apply it into a market that was, you know, dated. It just didn't apply, right? Nowadays, we've got an oversupply of information and an undersupply of an analytical stuff that works, right? But a lot of people think trading success comes from having 25 different indicators on your, on your uh, chart and multiple signals and all. No doesn't work like that trading comes trading success comes from your their ability to control your head it's it, it's that simple it's like you know when you go into a trade it doesn't matter i don't care if i've got a long long right i look at the chart and i go if i buy here i need to sell when it gets there and i need to take profits when it gets there that's what makes a trade work like that's you know 99 percent of your trade is going to work because you a knew when to get in signal B, you know when to get out, level, and you know when to tell that your trade is bust. That's it. You do those three things consistently. Doesn't matter what time frame you trade, doesn't matter what asset you trade. If you've got that, you'll be successful. But 90% of the time, people look at the signal. Okay, but you took the signal, but you didn't manage your trade. You didn't have a trailing stop. You didn't know when you were going to take profits. You didn't know when you knew if the trade was broken or not. Like, those are the things that count. Like, you know, whether your signal said long or short, you know, if you took this long signal and missed this one and it came all the way down and you're still holding this, you've made money not by design. You've made it by luck because you missed this exit. So you could have gone long, out, re-entry, and you would have avoided all of this. But most people aren't even aware of it. So, you know, they buy the trade, leave it, come back in six weeks and see it at minus 90. You know, and then they go, well, what do I do now? The best advice then is don't trade. If that's the way that you trade, don't trade because you'll just be, you know, wasting money. So everything comes down to how you organize your head, not your tools. Like the tools are superfluous to it. Your head comes first. Get your head right, get your plan right. The tools will work. You can have... I, I've got, I know that my, my tools are incredibly accurate, but if you take a bad trader with no discipline and give them good tools, they still won't work. <laughs> you know, they, they, they're still going to kill it. You know, so it's, it's just, it's a difficult alignment that you have to have. It's hard. That's the hard learn in trading is working out what your emotional makeup is so that your tools can work for you 
not you for your tools. So great advice, Chris. Well, I appreciate your time. Um, go over and check out Chris's product, Rogue Investing forward slash alpha, and tune in next time uh, for more information. Drop us a comment, a like, subscribe, and uh, we will talk to you uh, on next Thursday. Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> It's the Sorry. Benadryl, man. It's the Benadryl. Yeah, I know. I took some Benadryl. You know, hey, guys, just, just bear with me. <laughs> Take it All easy, right. my friend. I'll Take see care. You. Cheers. Yeah. Bye.